at home, I just stood up here and was a cheerleader for the whole announcements. Those were so good. You couldn't see that at home, but man, I was watching y'all watch those, and I wrote that Abby Arts announcement, and Naomi took it to another level. I was like, I'm going to sign up right now, and I wrote the announcement. Come on, there's something going on at this church, and as you know, listen, we've already had a great, amazing moment in the presence of God, and we took a little longer in worship, which is awesome. We really want to always wait on the Lord, not just to take time, but, but because we know he's got an agenda. Would you know it, those days where we wait a little longer in the presence of the Lord come on the day when I have so much to say. <laughs> Would you know it? So what I'm going to ask, I'm going to make a little covenant with you if I can. Okay, covenant's too strong a word maybe. Can we just make a deal, okay? Can we make a deal? I'm going to go fast, and will you just trust me? There's so much more to say about each slide. Because here's the deal, I see your faces and my heart is so passionate for you to understand that the Bible has more in it than we have ever known. And so every slide has so much scripture. But I want to get the bulk of the pow. Sunny morning is a pow. Sunny morning is where God meets you with a word encounter, with a spirit encounter that you are to chew on all week. So I'm going to go fast today. I can go slower. Come another day, maybe I'll go slower. This is not that day. I want to talk to you today about pioneering revelation as a way of life. And here's a quote. Anybody know where this is from? It is not the Beatles, but that is a very good... They, they did have a song called Revolution. Hamilton! Thank you. Someone over there. The Schuyler sisters in Hamilton, it's a great line Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote. He said, you want a, she says, you want a revolution, I want a revelation. And I want to say to you, beware of any revolutions that aren't based on revelation. But if you get enough revelation, the real stuff from heaven, you will experience a personal revolution that will then change your world. And that's where we're going today. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I talked to you about living in one reality in two forms at once. Go back and get that message. I'm telling you that was the vision of discipleship at the Abbey. That and what Paul did last week, those two messages, if you want to know, if you're new among us, if you're new online, what's the Abbey about? We're being graced right now to capsulize that. And so John 4.24 tells us that God wants people to worship him in spirit, top arrow, and in truth bottom arrow and we talked at length about that two weeks ago the message is called pioneering authenticity and then last week Paul talked about pioneering rest how many of you know that sine wave in the middle is where the rest is it's in the spirit his strength engaging your everyday life now the truth is most of us are well acquainted with the bottom arrow remember truth in that form doesn't mean the truth of scripture it means reality, vulnerability, transparency, real life, okay? So most of us are pretty keyed into that truth. Would it be true that most of you are pretty aware of the challenges of real life, right? When we come to the Lord, we're well aware of that, and we find we have to develop that top arrow of spirit because we're brand new at that. When we're born again, our spirit goes, whoa, I've just come alive. But our mind, will, and emotions are used to processing the knowledge of good and evil. So we find ourselves needing a huge dose of the spirit realm. It's not that it's, it's not that this realm is unimportant. It's just that that's the newest to us. Are you with me? So have you noticed, I don't know if you've noticed, there's a world out there that has also noticed this fact, especially in the pandemic. Do you know how many meditation apps there are? Dozens upon dozens upon dozens. If you Google how to be more spiritual, I'm not even kidding you. The first, I did it. The first three pages of things that come up are totally not Christian. And there's like 10 steps, 12 steps, 7 steps. I was confused. How many steps really are there to be more spiritual? There's so many different numbers of steps. The point is, this makes me furious because last time I checked, John 4, 24 that I just showed you said what? 
God is spirit. In the Greek, it's spirit, not even just a spirit. This should be our territory. And yet Christians are running from it and making the gospel what they think is easier, but it's actually more natural sometimes. And over here, did you notice, the world and the new age is rushing into the void. But we should own that void. I submit to you today that God has a plan to make the spirit dimension come alive in you, and that plan is called revelation. And by the way, this is just one picture when I googled how to be more spiritual, how to increase your spirituality, and I got all these secular things. This was the illustration from a study that people, scientists had done on somebody's brain when they're meditating. So like transcendental, you know, when they have a religious experience. Sadly, they listed the religious experiences they gathered together. None of them were the real deal. And yet, even then, they found difference in chemicals. Our brains are wired for spirit stuff, y'all. Meditation is that God, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and God knows how to take the spirit and make it real to our minds. We don't need what the world's offering. We've got the real thing if we lean into it. And today's about leaning into it. We don't need something that looks so otherworldly. God's world is even more wild, more wild than that. I hope you're excited about today. Thank you for that. So, let's go to the scriptures, which is where we should go. By the way, I wanted to point out, when Paul talked about the scripture in Hebrews 4.11, it says, let us enter into rest. If you caught this last week, he said, the very next scripture says, for the word of God is quick and powerful. So, in two scriptures, the word rest and then a mention of the power of the word of God. Keep that in your mind. Because see, if I were to say to you, if you've been around the Bible Belt, and I said, you need more Bible study, if I said that phrase to you, I promise you, a large percentage of you would not immediately think, oh, that sounds restful. You would think, oh, that sounds like work. Yeah, I should do that. But... That means there's more for us to understand about what God really wants to do in us through his word. So this is Matthew 16, 17, this scripture. And it's from the passage that's called Peter's Confession. And this is the greatest place to understand what Revelation is about, okay? So Jesus says to them, they're in front of Caesarea Philippi, so many redemptive keys in that passage. But basically, we're going to skip that and just go to Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And the disciples offer up some wrong answers. And then Peter says, I mean, then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, I, this is a familiar passage, so I don't think we realize Jesus literally, for him, flips out. Like, he is not used to people surprising him with getting it right in his earth walk. Right? Right? Like he talks about communion and they think, like, is he talking about cannibalism, eating flesh? Like, people, people did not understand him all the time during his earth walk. So Peter gets it right. And this sounds so, I know we always picture Jesus in the movies like, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. You know, but I think he went, whoa. And he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Now, that's going to be interesting in a minute because I don't think he went around going, Simon, son of Jonah, all the time. It's like, at home, we don't go, Paul, son of Eldon, is the coffee ready? <laughs> so I think that meant something. Because, and look at this, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Note, he goes on to say, and on that, that right there, what just happened? I'm going to build church. Yeah. So the real church is only that which is built upon what just happened. That's a big, pretty big passage on Revelation. Okay, so here's a couple of notes. Humans may teach you, but it takes your heavenly Father to reveal things inside you. Amen. The Father's chosen method of conveying information is inward revelation in intimacy with him. Did I say the chosen method of conveying revelation is Bible study? 
It could happen in Bible study, but it's not a guarantee. Something else has to go on. Now, uh, you're blessed when you operate in Revelation. Blessed means favored and fortunate. You want more blessing in your life? Don't necessarily pray for it. Ask God for a bigger revelation of him. That revelation attracts that reality out in the world. And then finally, Luke 12, 32, Jesus said later, Fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Here's a thought. Could it be that he gives it in a revelatory way even before it manifests outwardly? So we're like, God, where's the kingdom? Give me the, you said, give, you know, where, I don't see it. Maybe all the while he's trying to give you a revelation of the kingdom as a, as a beachhead for, the, for that to manifest outside you. So maybe he's building a revelation of healing in you that's going to manifest in your body. Can we be, again, that's living in two realms at once. We having fun yet? So the revelation was you are the Christ. And again, a little more about that same scripture. Jesus got excited about it. Look at these points about that same scripture. Jesus is drawing a contrast here between natural lineage and spiritual lineage. I have meditated on this scripture for 30 years, literally, and I've never seen this until this week. Why he said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because that father ain't what got you this. He didn't say because God, he said because my father in heaven. And later on, he was going to say, when he rose from the dead, he said, I'm going to heaven to see your father, my father, and your father. In other words, Jesus' purpose was to offer this fatherhood of God to humanity. And he said, look, he's basically saying, look, Peter, I've been watching you. You have defined yourself by your earthly set of parenthood, lineage, familial dysfunction. Have any of us ever done that? Oh, yeah, we all do it. He's saying, but today, this revelation is coming from a new fatherhood, a new parenthood, a new blood transfusion, a new lineage. In other words, don't you think he's sending a message about what church will be built on? What true discipleship is, is walking out of the earthly heritage you had. Still honor your parents. I'm not saying don't do that. But there's an earthly mindset you inherited that you need to trade in, and it'll take a lifetime, for the heavenly mindset that your father really wants to give you. Your fatherhood determines your source of knowledge. You were a son of Jonah, but now you're a son of God. Your identity and information source has changed. And I know we're nodding and going amen, but y'all, this is everything. Because when we hit a roadblock, we draw our information from the knowledge of good and evil that's housed in earthly parenting Again, your earthly fathers and mothers can model the good thing, but we're all human. And this world, by the way, this world can seep in even when parents don't mess up. This world can seep in and try to feed you a line of how to interpret stuff by earthly knowledge of good and evil. And so the whole of life is really about this last statement. Your source of knowing has been shifted. You are blessed when you realize that. The eyes of your heart will see the things that belong to your father because that's your inheritance. You can shift from focus on your natural father to revelatory relationship with your heavenly father. Some of us are still calling ourselves Perianne, daughter of Floyd, in the realm of the spirit. Do you get me? Again, I adore my daddy. And I honor the things that he, he's in heaven now, but I've honored and I will continue to honor the heritage that he put in me. But he, especially from heaven now, the last thing he wants is for me to be limited to the natural heritage he gave me. Because the heavenly father wants to give me the kingdom. A few important notes before we continue. Number one, the greatest revelations are often about the simplest truths not the most complex. It's a deeper way of receiving, more deeply personal and real, not a more educated or informational way. You can have a huge, well, look at Peter's. You are the Christ. 
Was that deep and complex? Well, yes, but no. It was deeper and more real. Number two, we have no need of weird revelation if we're living in the beauty of the real thing in intimacy with the Father. We charismatics are the worst at being famous for getting weird. But God doesn't want to make you weird. He wants to make you real. Now, spirit real, which will seem a little strange to some folks, but it's got a, it's got a anchor of authenticity in it. It's real about the truth. Um, people get weird. This is, I, I would tweet this out. I, um, I wrote a tweet. Nobody does Twitter anymore, do they? But anybody? No, not really. Anyway, this would be a good one. People get weird because they never got real. I love that. Okay, the, number three. The whole of the Bible is progressive revelation. So is our life. We hear this. Some of you need to hear this. We can revisit the truth that the Holy Spirit already unfolded in us. And in the hands of the Holy Spirit, it will become brand new again. Philippians 4.13, if you're a charismatic Christian that's been one for a few years, you probably had a moment where you had a revelation of, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For if you're in youth group, that would be high school, probably, we hope. But how many of you know, at 45, you might encounter something you don't know you can do? What do I do? Go, well, I've already got that scripture. I guess it's not working. No, (laughs) I go back to the place I once had revelation and I go do it again. I need to expose my heart again to the truth of I still can do at another level, at a higher level. It doesn't get old. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How many of you know that that didn't happen once when you were 20? That has to keep happening. So it's progressive revelation. You can grow in this. Uh, I love it because for me, it's like code, and the best definition of code is it's hidden in plain sight. The truths of Scripture, you know, they can wash what God loves you. Simplest truth of Scripture. God loves you. It's hidden in plain sight how profound that is. But don't feel bad if your mind goes, yeah, it's not helping me. Because your heart needs an unfolding of that. And that comes in intimacy with God. Y'all, believe me, take it from somebody that's walked this path. We need to stop beating ourselves up for our minds not getting it. Just drop down here. God's not mad at you for what your mind does. Okay, so this is big news if this is all that we said. The Father reveals. The Father reveals. In the garden, part of the lie was, hey, Adam and Eve, God's holding back on you. So they propagate, one of the things the enemy did was he propagated an image that God doesn't reveal. He doesn't share. Has the church held on to that? So much. You know, we all say, well, we may never know. And we may never know this side of heaven. But that's not the Father's heart. He's not holding back. He chose to self-disclose who he is or we wouldn't have Jesus, we wouldn't have a Bible, we wouldn't have you here today. He chooses to disclose. We have no need to figure life out for ourselves or grope in the dark, as the book of Acts says, to understand. We only need draw near to him. He is a self-disclosing God. And he demonstrates that in the most intimate of relationships, fatherhood. You may have had a father that didn't share his heart with you. He is not that father. Revealed means apocalypto, or the Greek word is apocalypto, which I love that word. Um, Not like the one-day apocalypse, but like apocalypse inside me. Come on, bring it. Revealed inside me. And it means to cover, to remove the cover away from something. Reveal what is hidden, veiled, or obstructed. Would it change your life if you believe today that God wanted to reveal what's hidden, veiled, or obstructed in your life? Especially in its inner makeup. To make plain or manifest, particularly what is immaterial or invisible. Blessed are you, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father removed the cover and showed you the real essence of his inner makeup. And upon that, I build my church. Not on your opinion of what it looks like, but on the real thing ongoing in you. Thank you. Even in the English definition, revelation means 
the divine supernatural disclosure to humans of something relating to human existence or the world. I want to say to you today, God's Father heart manifests in many ways. He shows his fathering in many ways, provision, protection, affection, the Father's hug from heaven, affirmation, but also a significant manifestation of the Father's heart is this revelation I'm talking about where he comes and makes it real to you here, here in you, so that you don't just have to try to perform at Christianity. Thank God. Aren't you glad you don't have to try hard to perform at Christianity? He wants the privilege of unfolding his universe to you, seen and unseen, imparting his heart to you in a deep place of knowing. My personal musing is, you know, the temptations of Jesus. The third one was, Satan took him and showed him all the kingdoms of this world. He said, if you worship me, I'll give you those. And Jesus resisted and said, no, I'll only worship my father. My personal musing on that is that Jesus knew you're not the source. He's the source. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus gave, I mean, God gave Jesus all the kingdoms of this world yeah. when he followed his path. So he knew that he only wanted to receive this, all of this, with the right partner who's the father, not the wrong partner. It's all about worship. Who you worship is your source of knowing. Who you worship is your source of knowing, and I'll read that last statement. Imparting his heart to you in a deep place of knowing. So we're really talking about switching from the knowledge of good and evil to life. And life is revelation. Life is revelatory. So, guess what? You're going to be, you're going to walk around going, I know a new word, and you're going to be so thrilled. Okay, various levels of thrilled. There are not one, but two Greek words for the word knowledge. One is gnosis, one is epinosis, but both are translated knowledge. So can you see how in English we already lost something there? Because we don't, we just translate them the same. The Greek was chosen by God as the language of the New Testament, I believe, to house this truth. Now, the word epinosis, the Apostle Paul loved it. it the verb epigenosko is uh, used 46 times in the New Testament, and the noun is used 21 times. That's the epinosis. So you can tell it's not just some obscure thing I picked out. Gnosis is the common Greek word for knowledge, and it, it does mean experiential knowledge. It means you've had firsthand experience, so you know something. It's the same as like um, conocer in Spanish that means to be acquainted with. So it does mean an experiential knowledge, but epignosis is an intensification of that word, and it means, it still means firsthand experiential knowledge, but implies full or complete knowledge, and is sometimes translated true knowledge. Get this. Epinosis is not saying that you know everything completely, but it is saying when you have epinosis of Scripture, we experience God's knowledge and recognize it with full discernment. The power of the Scripture overcomes us, and we get it, and it influences us now in all aspects of life. You know, a couple of slides ago when I said um, this revelation need not be complex, you know, have you ever seen anybody that just got a revelation of I can do all things through Christ? I mean, they're annoying if you're not walking in that at that moment. <laughs> Charismatics that get lit on the inside are annoying if you're not walking in it. And so they're like going, I can do all things. And you're like, shut up. Because <laughs> I'm not there right now. Whatever, you know. But that's what happened is they something, they got it. God's word burst on them, not just as Bible study, but as life. Amen. And that's the purpose of God's word. I'm going to hit hard on the words Bible study today because I, I just got stirred up about it this week, that we Christians make anything boring. <laughs> and we go back to sounding like the knowledge of good and evil, even though we don't mean to. And so then I bet you, I'm not asking for a show of hands, don't even raise your hand at home. But if I said, how many of you feel guilty that you don't spend enough time in Bible study? I don't even want to know. But, but if I said, how many of you have had a, one scripture burst on you like fire 
while you were driving down the road. Hey, I'd take that 10,000 times over hours of Bible study. And yet, if you don't expose yourself to the scriptures, you're not giving God an enzymatic surface to work on. Ooh. What? One Greek scholar says, Epinosis is the complete comprehension after the complete comprehension after the first knowledge of a matter. In other words, here's your beginning. Whoa, I've encountered a truth. But there's somewhere to go. What if you landed at London Heathrow? Plan to do that again someday. I remember doing that. Uh, what if you landed at London Heathrow, got through immigration, and said, I'm just going to stay in the airport? I'm in London. That's all I wanted. That's what we do. First encounter with God's truth. Get your luggage and go travel. Epinosis. That just came to me on the spot. <laughs> on the spot. It's a British example. British examples make me happy. Epinosis is a complete comprehension after the first knowledge of a matter. is better acquainting me with a thing I knew before. A more exact viewing of an object that I saw before at a distance. That little portion of knowledge which we had shall be much improved. Our eyes shall be raised to see the thing more strongly and clearly. clearly. By the way, in all of Paul's prayers for the church, Paul wrote tons of prayers for the church. I pray the eyes of your heart be flooded with, night, with light. Everywhere he prayed over the church, epinosis. Everywhere he stated his passion and his desire for the church, epinosis. Everywhere you find a word about, like, I'm praying you have discernment, perception, it all says, it'll say, in the knowledge of Christ. Whatever he prays, lists of things he prayed for, are closed with, in the knowledge of Christ. And he doesn't use gnosis, he uses epinosis. You think the Apostle Paul knew a little about going on into the truths of God? Here's a, here's a summary. So, Gnosis means having encountered firsthand a perception that cannot be avoided. Isn't that good? But epinosis denotes greater participation by the knower in the object known, thus more powerfully influencing him. Lays stress on participation with the truth. I'm smiling so big. I love it. A greater participation, a union of the knower with the known. We're in union with Christ. Let's live into it. Mm. Suggest generally, epinosis, suggests generally a directive, a more special recognition of the object known than mere gnosis. In, it lays stress on participating with the truth. Okay, I'm going to break it down even more for you with this picture. Here's what it's like. This is Hosea 6.3. And, and there's a great picture of those two kinds of knowledge. It says, let us know, let us press on to know. Let us gnosis, let us epinosis. Let's do both. Let's don't stop. Let's grow. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. And look at this. His going out is as sure as the dawn, and he will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. I submit to you that gnosis and epinosis are as different as gnosis is I check my phone and it says, like it has for the past 10 days, it's going to rain. Epinosis is what she's doing. It's going to rain. That's truth. I must deal with it. I should take an umbrella. I'm aware it's going to rain. What if, however, I remember that that's a blessing and I enjoy that rain? Do y'all, there's a, at this point she pauses to quote a Dave Matthews line. In number 41, there's a great line Dave wrote. Why won't you run into the rain and play and let tears splash all over you? I, I cried uh, yesterday looking at this slide. I got a tear in my eye because I thought, man, don't let adulthood take that out of my life. Why won't you run into the rain and play and let tears, your own tears, splash all over you? Tears of joy, tears of sadness, doesn't matter. 
why won't you why won't you let the tears of you mingle with the tears of heaven why won't you run into the rain and play ah or if you don't like Dave and some don't um you, we have Natasha Bedingfield from a few years ago feel the rain on your skin what's the next line no one else can feel it for you so I'm going to skip that one, uh, put it in the midweek. Let me just say, the while well, that's up there, I'm not going to read this. This will be in the midweek message. Epinosis is a useful word, seeing that gnosis, the word gnosis, in the time of the Bible had become associated with Gnosticism, which is a heresy that I talked about two weeks ago, dualistic heresy. It was rampant in the church, so it was useful to Paul to use this word epinosis, because the Gnostics were running around saying, you need this elite goofball knowledge that we have. That's what they were doing. It's mystery religion. And Paul was looking at Gnosticism, which was a, a bogus spirituality that was rampant. And he was like, oh, yeah? Y'all got knowledge? Look at this knowledge. Revelation knowledge from heaven. We've got something higher than you're making up. We've got the real thing that would actually fill the void in you that you're searching to fill. And that and Gnosticism is still around. In fact, this picture came from a Google of Gnosticism. Gnosticism's all over the internet. Epinosis. Epinosis has been summed up by somebody, a Christian, as super knowledge. Now I like that. Or the way he explained it, intelligence on an otherworldly level. That can only mean revelation. God wants to give you a knowledge that the world is clawing after, meditating into or attempting to, that the world is, you know, listening to demons to be informed about. God wants to give you the real deal. So you were made, your spirit being, you were made for revelation. And it doesn't make you weird. It makes you exceedingly powerfully useful and more real than you started out at the beginning. Because God made you. God made you. He, has a re he knows how to operate you. He is the owner of you, and he knows how to get the best out of you. Revelation. Epinosis isn't necessarily a greater quantity of knowledge, but rather a higher quality of knowledge that informs everything else you know. It's revelation. It's spiritual knowledge. And I said it before. It's what Gnosticism was searching for in all the wrong places. Paul is responding to the Gnostic heresy that's still around today, and he's offering an even higher knowledge fully available to all in Christ. Shouldn't we be offering the same thing? Shouldn't we? I want to proclaim that the real God-imparted revelation of truth far exceeds the false gnosis obtained by flesh and blood with the occasional help of demons. One person said, gnosis, not epignosis, but gnosis, is only as good as its source. So in the case of Gnosticism, it has human source, demonic source. But epignosis is always sourced by the Father. So gnosis could be false, epignosis could not. So the Father's heart, revelation, epignosis. Let's go back to Peter in Matthew 16, and I'm going to start... We're going to begin our descent into London Heathrow now. Let's go back to Peter in Matthew 16. Let me ask you this question. How did Peter get that revelation? Have y'all watched The Chosen? Peter's pretty accurate, I think, on The Chosen. Peter's pretty accurate just in the Bible. And can I tell you, Peter was not doing great at his Bible study. <laughs> he was running around just like, when are you going to overthrow the Romans? He was seething with just self-effort and resentment towards Rome and blah, 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 blah. So can we just remember that the guy that got the major revelation that founded the church wasn't trying hard? <laughs> that would have been another disciple, but it, would, it weren't him. So how did he get that revelation? He'd been hanging out with the Logos. Yeah. Jesus is the living word. You need to not hang out with just the written word. You need to hang out with the Logos. You're going to find him in the word but please say, Holy Spirit, come on. I want to know you in this word. 
he'd been shifting his allegiance from earth to heaven's fatherhood and knowledge. But I submit to you at this point, he still didn't even know he'd gotten it right. Because right after that, he goofed up. Right after that, he gets told, get thee behind me, Satan. He did. <laughs> Y'all, it's not as hard as we make it. God put Peter in this position to tell us there's hope for every one of us. Your father determines your inheritance in the spirit. Your father is your source of information and identity. There's more to say about that, but I want to continue our descent into London Heathrow. So, in the time we have left, I want to give you a model, and this can hang with me just a minute or just a few minutes longer, because this could really bring it home for you. I want to give you a model of being renewed by revelation. This is the bronze laver from the Old Testament tabernacle, the one Moses was told to build. If you want to look it up, it's Exodus 30, 18 through 21. He said, make a bronze laver, that's a laver, wash basin for the hands and feet. And he said, put it between the altar and the tent of meeting so that the priests, Aaron and his sons, now we're all priests, y'all know that. It's not a one family, it's all of us. So that the priests can wash in it, and then the scripture's real specific, it says, so they won't die. So there was a need for this cleansing. It does. It says it twice. So they won't die when they come in the presence of God. Okay, so Moses did it, and it was built. He delegated it, as a good leader can do. And um, remember that this tabernacle represented God's presence among his people, okay? Now, in the New Testament, we don't have a physical tabernacle anymore, but the book of James describes the words of God as the perfect law of liberty, which is like a mirror that we gaze into. That's James 1, 23 through 25. And then Paul in Ephesians says that the words of God are cleansing waters. That's Ephesians 5, 26. Can I submit to you, though we don't go into a tabernacle, we still, we still kind of pause to make sure we're not going to die between the altar and the tent of meeting. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we've heard it preached. The way into God's presence is open. Jesus made the way for you just as you are. True. But don't we still get caught up in our heads about, but have I sacrificed enough? Am I good enough? Have I studied enough? And sometimes we get like high on, it's not about my performance. But when challenge hits us, instead of, instead of washing, we kind of go back and worry about the altar. And to the point that sometimes you're like, maybe I'm not even right with God. Right? It's all of us. So what I submit to you is even though we don't go into a tabernacle, there's still a bronze laver to wash in. But in the New Testament, it's the word of God. Yeah. In the New Testament, it's yeah. the mirror of who you are in Christ. Look at that priest's face. Nothing was said about washing his face. But to wash, he had to look. He had to peer into the waters that are a new mirror to him. But, but it doesn't stop there. We're washing our identity. Guess what? Look at this. Little verse. Exodus 38, 8. And he made, this craftsman, made the laver of, blast, of brass and the base, therefore brass, brass and bronze are the same thing, from the mirrors of the ministering women that ministered at the door of the tent of meaning. That's a mirror back in that day. You know what it would have been? plunder from Egypt. When the children of Israel escaped from Egypt, God told them to gather riches. Those Hebrew women ministered. They wouldn't let them in the tabernacle, but they ministered at the door. Oh, there's so much here. Okay, remember last week Paul said the soul is often, it's a female noun in the Greek. So there's this picture of the soul as almost like a female mind, will, and emotions. So the soul is standing. Get this picture. The standing outside the door ministering. And there's a picture here of we need to melt down the reflections from Egypt. What's Egypt? The world. Egypt's everything that's not the knowledge of God. In the Bible, Egypt represents the old you, the old mind, the old judgments. Even bronze represents man, human judgment, human thought, human conclusions. And God's saying, hey, the thing that's hanging you up between the altar and the presence is the fact that you need to melt down your old mirrors yeah. 
and wash your identity, wash your soul in who you are in Christ. Don't you dare think we don't bog down still today. We don't die physically like the priest would have, but if we don't come and just get that free, intimate love from the Father, we're dying already, aren't we? And we don't have to do it. But the price is, what's your labor? What's your bronze labor? What does it look like? What revelation do you need to bathe in? We still have mirrors to melt and fill with cleansing streams. In what ways today do your inward mirrors need to be melted? You know, now we even know that we have mirror neurons. That's why when you watch an action movie, you feel like you're clenching like if the guy gets hit, you feel the pow, right? Has anyone ever done that? Yes? Mirror neurons. Right. In other words, I'll show you the pictures. Let me just say this. You, <laughs> uh, this is me hurrying, but it's so good. Oh, let me, let, here, here's what a labor looks like, just so you know. Here's a labor from today. This is recently I had to face an event that scared me. So this is two pages of scripture. Can I just tell you, this was not Bible study to me. This was Bible seizure to me. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I wasn't going, Lord, educate me in your word about what is necessary to rise up in the occasion of said fear in front of my face. I was like, oh. and I wrote them in, ten, in several translations. You know what the rules are? Whatever connects. Get it. Go shopping. It's free. Take it. Four pages. Did I know these scriptures already completely? Had I copied them down before? Oh, so much. Did it matter? That, I, wasn't, I wasn't memorizing. I wasn't studying. I was making a bronze labor to wash my identity in because I realized I had let something slip. Y'all might not like this. So don't do it this way. Find you a way. I like this way. You know what? Yeah. I like journals because it's science to me. Okay, so here's the point. Look at this. Go back to that James scripture. I really am landing. We're so close to landing at Heathrow. James 1.25. Remember I said it says, He who looks intently into the perfect law of liberty. The word for look intently is the word paracrypto. And it literally means in the Greek to stoop or bend down and peer into, look intently into, bend beside or lean over so as to peer within. If we just read a scripture, we haven't peered into it yet, have we? We might gnosis, but God's calling us to epinosis. Interact with it in a brand new way. So I rewrote that as he who begins to see his own freedom there. He who looks intently into the scripture, he who begins to see his own freedom there. And what I mean by that is, uh, whoa, where's my slide? There's a slide of John 3.14, and then a bunch of, I have three, hey, thank you so much. Okay, um, man, I always say I have a personal relationship with PowerPoint. I just demonstrated that. Such joy. Okay. Um, John, when Jesus spoke about his death, he, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, just like that, the Son of Man must be lifted up. That story is in Numbers 22. The children of Israel were being bitten by snakes. They were dying from serpent bites. And God told Moses to make a brass serpent, <laughs> lots of brass, lots of bronze, and put it on a pole, and whoever looked would not die, would live. And that's exactly what happened. He did it. And people got healed from snake bite. Okay, can I tell you, Jesus said, that's me. I'm taking the serpent on me on the cross. But can I tell you that to these dudes, that serpent on a pole was highly relevant. If you're laying there dying from a serpent bite and you look up and there, there's a serpent, it does, you don't need a seminar on what that means. <laughs> right? But today, when we just tell people, hey, you know, Jesus died for all your sin, all your mess up, we don't instantly see my exact problem is on that cross. That's what I mean by look intently. 
until the general concept of what Jesus bore on the cross shows up as your exact problem. So you're not just looking intently like, let me understand a more theological definition of the scripture. That's great if it manifests in you actually seeing yourself on the cross with him. Your real self, your real problem, your real fear, your real struggle, your real impasse. It's not to the heart of you until you see yourself there. So what I want to close with is mirrors get messed up. We are mirroring creatures. We have mirror neurons. But human mirrors fail because none of us are all the way on this journey. So many of you have had mirrors shown. You have an image of who you are, how you deal, how you do, whether you're a loser or a winner, whether you're struggling or not, and they come from human sources. We all do. Here's some more. Maybe you had some funhouse mirrors in your past. You had some really warped people that said, you're weird. Never mind, they were weird. <laughs> or, this is my favorite. If you do anything in the public eye, this is an art installation, an art piece in a museum, but I just saw this years ago and I grabbed it because I was like, if you do anything in the public eye, can anyone relate that picture? It's like there's all these people forming opinions of who you are. And how do I know this? Because they'll walk up and tell you. I mean, I, I really try not to make a big deal of it, but you know, there's some people that form an opinion just because I'm a woman preaching, and they have walked up and told me. So, are all these mirrors correct? Everybody can have their opinion, and we should all love and share and be open and authentic, but the danger comes if I let that determine my true identity more than my Father in heaven. Your failures can be those mirrors. Your failures can be in your face going, yeah, you're sitting there saying you're more than a conqueror according to scripture, but you know what? I saw how well you walked in that last season. That's a warped mirror. So, here we go. I just want to tell you for your own joy, bronze Let's go back to the fact that these mirrors, this picture we're in, in the Old Testament, the soul's mirrors were melted to make the labor. The old views someone had of you or you had of yourself, God wants to melt them and fill it with new identity. To make the very labor. You don't need to go out and buy bronze or brass. You need to melt the mirrors and let that house the new identity. Let me just tell you so you'll be happy. Bronze melts at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit about, or 1,000 degrees Celsius. How did the Hebrews get bronze that hot? I don't know, but they did. If they can do it, how much more can God do it with your old mirrors? So, only in the Spirit the waters that cleanse and renew are also the fires that melt the old mirrors of Egypt. Naomi, would you please come to the keyboard? Here's the thing. I think sometimes what we do is we just go, just get more word, get more word. In other words, I understand that when I show you my two pages of scriptures that I've lost already, but you saw them. The page, here they are. The pages of, no, they're not. Okay, y'all saw my two pages of scriptures. <laughs> Wherever they are. Um, some of y'all did an old charismatic knee jerk of like, oh yeah, we put them on our fridge. We, you know, it was like, if I just get enough scripture in me, I'll be okay. And sometimes that can work, especially if your personality just keeps going with it, because the scripture will win. In the end of the day, the scripture will win. But can I tell you, a lot of people never got there because they didn't let it melt their old mirrors you got to do both. The new you wants to also melt your old concept. That's what, throughout the New Testament, Paul goes, put on the new man. What does that mean? Is it like a jacket? It is that I let the new reality he's offering me be my reality. And sometimes I'm confronted with a choice. Will I let that mirror that I've held so long melt at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit? Y'all, that's hot. That's hot. So, 
this morning, I feel like there's an offer on the table to us all. And yeah, you can go ahead. There's an offer on the table to us all. Uh, one thing I didn't quote is that when Moses was told, I'm going to paraphrase it here, but I promise it's in there. When Moses was told to build this laver for the priests to wash in, after he, so they wouldn't die, twice he said it, the next thing he said is, this, this will be a perpetual statute for all generations to come. You know what that means? That means long after there's no tabernacle in the wilderness, people will still be living into the reality of needing their identity cleansed every time they come into my presence. Fighting the tendency for their soul to try to chase them out of the presence of God. And can I tell you, we don't get to a place, epinosis is all that, but we don't get to a place that we don't have to do this. Because there's always things that rise up in us that we don't see coming. Our mind, will, and emotions accuse us. Or someone else accuses us. Right? We can always let it melt with a fervent heat. The fire of God, charismatic Pentecostals have made the fire of God so scary. I mean, man, it should be the most welcome thing on the planet because it is melting your dysfunction. It is melting the false images of who you are that have been handed out to you through your whole life. We forgive those people, don't we? You know why they handed out warped mirrors to us? Think of people that handed you a warped mirror. You know why they did it? Because they had a warped mirror. Somebody handed them one and they never let it melt in the fervent heat and they didn't wash their identity peering into the basin. Paul, why don't you come and join me? As we... Did you have anything to share before we pray? Just two things Absolutely. real quick. That fire, Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will baptize you with fire. It's the Holy, takes the Holy Spirit to intensely yeah. melt our old image of ourselves. Yeah. It's for him to give us a new image. The second thing is in that labor, the reason that that, that basin was where it was at and that the priests washed their hands in it, is because the priest had just slaughtered the sacrifice, which is a lot of heavy, dirty, hard work. Their whole, their whole arms were covered with the blood of the sacrifice. And so they brought it to the laver and they plunged their arms into the water in that laver. And what washed off of them was the blood. It's the blood of Jesus in the water that reflects back the in the true image of who we are that we are now the righteousness of God the blood of Jesus is effective to cleanse us from unrighteousness so before we go into the presence into the holy place into the holy of holies it's the blood of Jesus that has cleansed us it's not our own works it's not our own efforts but it's the blood of Jesus that has cleansed us. So we're not just looking at water in a and in an old mirror. We're looking at the blood of the sacrifice that makes us a new creation, that makes us qualified to enter into the presence of God and stand before the throne without fear, without guilt, without condemnation. Not because of what we've done, but because of what He's done through His sacrifice. So that's the image that we get. I just sense that there, are, what the what the Lord wants to do, just as we close, is that there's people that all of us, to some degree, but we have stalled out between the altar and the presence. There's some some area of hesitance that we don't just run freely into the presence, and God's wanting us to wash in that. And the other thing is back to the whole thing of Simon, son of Jonah versus Simon, son of the father. Just know that there's still for every one of us our old notions of who we are in the natural that even can be generational. And that is washed here. Yes, it's, yes, it's, it's gone in the presence. But if any of that is holding you back, religion enters into that. So 
you've been born again. Maybe maybe you, this is your first time to, to watch us, to be with us. The Heavenly Father wants to give you the kingdom. He wants to introduce you to Him and He also wants to introduce you to yourself. That's right. And He gives you an open invitation. He's done all the work. All he says that's required is to believe. Whosoever believes in him. That's, that's his only ask. And you just want to come home. Maybe, maybe you're saying, wow, I have I've been striving in my own strength to just live life in my by myself. And I need to come home. We invite you, if you're at home, we invite you to make a comment whatever medium you're on, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, send us an email at hope at theabbeychurch.com. Just reach out, communicate to us so that we can have someone pray with you, respond to you, pray for you. Same here, if you're here in among us in the house, you can communicate the same way or wave at us, let us know, and someone will come and pray a personal prayer with you, but we want to always give open invitation to return home to the, the heart of the Father who loves you so much He gave His only Son. So we always want to make that available to individuals. So we thank you, Father. And I just, the word I heard as we were praying, I just heard Jesus say over His disciples, that's you and me. Now are you clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Today, the words that have come to you through his servant, now are you clean through the words which I have spoken to you. 
So as we go today, we go clean, and we know how to come back to the Word and let it wash over us and find out who we truly are and no longer for the enemy to pervert. I just heard that again. Why won't you run into the rain and play let the tears wash all over you? God's heart. Stand with me. Naomi, do you have a song? Uh, yes. <laughs> awesome. Let's just close with the song. We so appreciate you being with us today. We love you. We declare you are blessed this week. And he goes with you as you go. like it never has before, that every single word will not just be a little avenue of who you are, but a living embodiment of your presence. Lord, we just thank you. Abby Church, we love you. Uh, thank you for being with us, whether you're in person or online. Uh, if you would like to continue your worship through offering in person, we have baskets at the main exit. We love you, and we can't wait to see you next week. much for joining the Abbey service today. We are so thankful for you and we pray that this message blessed you this week. Don't stop here. Stay connected with us by liking us on Facebook and subscribing to our YouTube channel. 
Please see below for additional ways to receive updates and news, as well as stay engaged with our Abbey community. You can also support the Abbey through giving on any of our platforms. We are grateful for your continued giving to help us reach people around the world and grow the kingdom through local and international missions. Thank you again for watching. We love you and God bless.